Thanks for coming today, everybody. Um, before we get started, um, I thought I'd like to acknowledge the weight of this topic, uh, homelessness in our community in Santa Cruz. Um, we've all brought our own experiences here today and some strong emotions. Um, if we could just take a moment to set an intention as a group to be present, um, to be here all together, and we even take a big deep breath. Thanks, maybe one more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the closing event for the Visions and Voices exhibition. Um, please make sure to check out the photography of uh, Andrea Ruiz, one of our fine panelists. It's on the back wall uh, in that smaller room. Um, the work will be coming down tomorrow, so it's sort of a last chance. Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, the moderator for today's panel, Don Lane, the chair of Smart Solutions to Homelessness and co-founder of Homeless Services Center. Thank you, Marcia. And I just want to um, say a quick thank you to the gallery for hosting this and for Marcia and her team for putting this together. It's a really um, great idea to have this event. It's a really great space for us to gather. Um, Marcia said a, a little bit about me, and I'll just say a few words more. Um, in 1990, um, I was a member of the Santa Cruz City Council, and I helped a meal program that was being um, present on the streets right by the next to the town clock to find a new location to, that was a little um, more structured and uh, protected for the clients who were eating there. Um, help, help them find a new location, and it happened to be at the corner of River and Coral, um, a familiar site to many of you. Um, there wasn't much there then. Um, and then from that little meal program, I, along with a whole bunch of other people, worked to create um, what became the Homeless Community Resource Center. Maggie McKay was there with us uh, doing that. and. Um, from there, um, that merged with some other organizations to become the Homeless Services Center today. Uh, so I've been doing work in this, this arena for a long time, 30 years or so. Um, after I, I worked with the Homeless Services Center for many, many years, and including as a staff person for a little while. Um, after that, after I se separated myself a little bit from the Homeless Services Center, I helped start Project Homeless Connect here in Santa Cruz, and then um, started this group called Smart Solutions to Homelessness. And I also serve as a member of the governing board of the Homeless Action Partnership, which is a county-wide co-collaboration of many organizations and government agencies that work on homelessness. So, enough about me. Um, why are we here? Um, I think, as you probably saw, that one of the main purposes of this event is to dispel myths and dispel incorrect assumptions and move past generalizations that many people have about homelessness. Um, part of it is, um, I think what we're trying to do is see homelessness more clearly, see its diversity and complexity and its humanity. Um, my, my own work with my, the organization Smart Solutions suggests that one of the biggest challenges we have in successfully addressing homelessness is an absence of actually of good information in the community. We can't successfully address a problem if we uh, define that problem incorrectly, and sometimes that's what's going on, I think. The other part of, other purpose I think we're here is to talk about some things that are working. The growth of visible homelessness in our community has re actually reduced some of our capacity to see that individuals and families are exiting homelessness every week through thoughtful and compassionate partnerships. And we'll hear uh, from three folks today to learn more about that. So at this point, I want to introduce our panelists, um, Andrew Ruiz, who, and, and they will all introduce themselves more fully, but I'll just give you a quick intro. Andrew Ruiz is a participant in the 180-2020 um, housing program. She had been homeless for about three and a half years and then was um, housed um, about a year and a half ago 
with the assistance of the Housing Authority voucher and uh, some support from staff at HSC. Um, Karen Chappelle is a homeless garden project trainee and also a current participant in the recuperative care program, which is located at the, the Homeless Services Center campus. And then Aaron, Aaron Gady is a program manager at the Recuperative Care Center and also at Page Smith Community House, a transitional housing. <coughs> so just a real quick thing before I have them start um, talking is make sure we know that it's important, and I, I'm not worried, but I think it's just worth saying that we're always respectful to each other as we talk. <coughs> Homelessness is obviously a very heated issue in the community, and there's plenty of heat right now all over the place. So I hope we'll stay a bit cooler and stay very respectful as we hear from our guests, panelists, and not have any questions. <coughs> um, so, um, it's really, we're really grateful to your, our panelists for stepping up and sharing their stories with us. So I hope we'll be especially kind to them and thank them for having the show for us <coughs> for volunteering to uh, spend their time with us today. And third, because we, um, we do anticipate having some time for questions at the end, um, um, but we know that this is Santa Cruz and that what we call audience questions time usually turns into an open mic for commentaries of all sorts. So as the moderator, I will limit your time to ask your question to about one minute. If you never end up asking a question, that will be okay. Just know that you only have one minute for your question. So we prepared um, a few questions ahead of time so the panelists are, we're not going to be surprised and we're going to get right to that. So first, um, let's uh, start with Karen. And I'll ask each of you to do this. Um, just introduce yourself and tell us some of your story, perhaps how you became homeless and what it's been like for you to be without a home of your, your own. Um, and then for Aaron, obviously, you, you might have a little different story, but introduce yourself and tell us about the work you do in your program. So, here you go. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Chupel, and um, I'm originally from Los Altos, California, and I moved over here in 2004 to be closer to my daughter. I had started, I had medical problems. I owned a home in Sunnyvale and um, I had medical issues. And I placed my daughter with my sister who lived in Boulder Creek um, while I was dealing with my medical issues. I was a single parent, so I didn't have anybody in the home to take care of her. And my medical issues were relatively serious. So I ended up placing my daughter with my sister and um, my sister filed for custody. And um, so I had to sell my home in Sunnyvale and um, move over here and I continued my treatment over here and um, yeah you know family is weird and um, yeah <laughs> so um, I moved over here and I rented a home in Felton in the Santa Cruz Mountains and um, I was reunited with my beautiful daughter who is now 27 um, in 2005 and I got a job at Palace Art and Office Supply, a great local company, and I was an account manager there for five years and loved it. We built a um, great life over here. We had horses at Covered Bridge Farm, she and I, and um, great friends and part of the community. And um, then I eventually got laid off from Palace in 2010, and I made three mistakes few bad mistakes. I have a history of depression and um, so I went into a depression after being laid off which led to alcohol and drug abuse and I isolated myself and it led to some um, delusional thinking, some hallucinations, some, some audio hallucinations which led to an episode which um, led to an arrest. And um, I didn't harm anyone in that episode. There was nobody physically present, but I was arrested for terrorist threats. And I ended up spending eight months in jail 
because I was continually found unfit to stand trial because I was loopy. And, um, you know, once I was into that delusional thinking, I was in jail, so I was not under any influence of alcohol or drugs, but um, you know, my thinking was loopy. It took a long time to find the right meds to get me thinking back in order. So um, after eight months in jail, um, I was finally released in October of 2013, and I had my family and friends had basically walked away. I had lost all my possessions. Um, I had no resources. My credit was ruined. I lost my horse. Um, the only one that was still standing by me was my daughter Katie, and um, you know she'd been, you know, trying to stick with me and trying to keep my life together outside of jail, and it was impossible for her. You know, she was a youngster, and, and um, so I, I was let out of jail onto the street, and I had the shirt on my back, and um, nothing more. And I was basically unemployable, and um, and I've been fighting my way back ever since. I have, you know, I'm fairly intelligent, and I have good work skills, and I've been in sales and customer service my whole life. So, so I um, I started just hustling and cleaning houses and um, becoming a personal organizer for people. I'm really good at personal organizing and helping people get rid of their crap. And um, so I started working with people that were hoarding, and and um, and I was very successful for about three years, and and I ended up with a, a small, um, I called it the big boy RV, but it was a, a van. It was a, a little RV, and I lived in that and did it successfully, and then um, and then um, I got complacent, and I wasn't going to meetings and. And so I got back into the alcohol and drugs, and um, and I lost the RV, and um, it got towed because I was stupid. And so um, I ended up living in a car, but I kept my business going. And then, I, um, long story short, I ended up having surgery a year ago, and um, I had an impaction in my bowel and um, the recovery was about three months and I stayed at the RCC and in that three months I lost all my clientele and I just didn't have it in me to build it back up again so I just kind of was deflated and um, I still had this criminal record um, and I just I couldn't sell myself to a corporation and um, so Eventually, I found the Homeless Garden Project. I had applied and, and gotten hired by the Valero on Ocean Street, and I worked there for three weeks, and I did a bang-up job. And um, then they got my background report back, and they fired me like that, and I was just like devastated. And instead of going back to the drugs and alcohol, I talked to a friend and said, do you know anybody that would give me some day work? And he said, why don't you check out the Homeless Garden Project? You know, they'll give you some work. And I went out there and I met Ansley Roberts, who's the supervisor of all the trainees. And she said, why don't you work with us for a day as a volunteer and see how you like it? And it was amazing working on that farm. You know, it was challenging and it was beautiful. and. It Everybody was welcoming, and and I loved it, and I couldn't wait to go back. So um, I volunteered there for a couple of weeks, and then I had an interview with Derry and Ansley, and they hired me, and it changed my life. You know, they are such a blessing, and um, I can't say enough about them. But um, in the interim. Um, I ended up, I worked for them over the summer, and I was living in a suburban at the time. And there was plenty of challenges there, living in a car, but, but you know, I make it work. And um, I gave myself a double hernia, 
because my abdominal wall was weakened from my previous surgery. So I'm back at the RCC and um, healing this time and being very careful about my body. And um, the challenges that, that I find that are, are most confronted for me as, as far as being homeless is what I took for granted when I wasn't homeless was that I was part of humanity. I was, you take it for granted that you're a part of humanity. And when you're homeless, your lack of humanity hits you in the face every single day because people look at you like you're less and they treat you like you're less. And most people who meet me and talk to me don't realize that I'm homeless. And so they will make comments about the homeless to me or around me. And it, it hurts so much, I can't even tell you. Because, because I am homeless. And, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, we're all the same. We're all people. I'm just unhoused. You know, I mean, I understand that there's a criminal element that, that um, gets to us all. And it gets to me, too. You know, I can't stand the criminal element myself. But um, it doesn't necessarily mean, just because we're unhoused doesn't mean we're criminal or um, should be abused or looked down upon um, because it's circumstances. And in this county, um, there's just a lack of affordable housing because I have worked my ass off since I've been unhoused. And it's very difficult to crawl back up once you lose everything. And it, you know, I don't want to throw myself a pity party, but um, you know, it's, it's difficult to get back up. And, and over the past couple of years, um, I've been working really hard at it, and I will make it. I will do it. Thank you. Sent him a, you know, 
a Stephen Ray Vaughan uh, thing that I that I did, and he was just like, yeah, come on down, join my band, and I'm like, cool. And then I got there, and I was just like unable to play because I was disabled, and so he let me stay for a while. Thank God he wasn't an axe murderer. <laughs> you never know where you find our places, but he, you know, he helped me a lot. And so I stayed down in San Diego for a while and checked out a lot of things and um, was very um, kind of grateful to be on this journey, but I didn't know where else to go. And so I just kind of started traveling up north. And um, anytime I, I tell people I was a photographer, they're like, you have to go to um, Santa Cruz. And I'm like, where's Santa Cruz? I Google it. I, I'd seen the skateboard, I'd seen the logos, and I'm like, I know it's in California, but where? And so I Googled it, and I'm like, oh, I just have to keep heading up north. So, uh, so I did, and I, and, I, and I came out here, and, and uh, well, actually, I Googled it, and I saw the boardwalk, and I'm like, they have a roller coaster. Oh my God, <laughs> I don't go there. So, <laughs> I was really happy to head up here for the roller coaster, which I hadn't been able to ride yet until last week, so I was like, really happy. That I was like, my God, I guess you sit down and ride the roller coaster. Because that was like my, my whole jam when I got here. And so, um, so I, I just kind of hit the streets here, and I had to really just approach it like um, very strategically. I was like, okay, what can I do in this situation? Because really everything that I was going to go through, I was now left my devices. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to be like, and then I thought for a moment, I was like, okay, those guys, they go on missions, the Navy SEALs. So I was like, I got to adopt a Navy SEAL mentality. And I was like, what do I have to do? And I said, I have to scan my environment. I have to find ways to survive. I'm on a mission, it's open-ended, and it's not going to be over until I get housed. So I didn't know how much, how long that was going to be, because, you know, I really didn't have any, any, any goal except that. And so um, you start looking at your surroundings differently. All of a sudden, it's like you're going to 7-Eleven, and you're not going to get gas and gum. You're actually looking at structure of the buildings to see, can I sleep there? Is it going to be safe? Will I get harassed by the cops? Am I going to be sexually assaulted? Will I sleep there? If I sleep there? Or any other place? Because now it's like, you know, you're, you're on the outside of society. You've fallen so far off the social ladder that people don't want anything to do with you. You're shunned, basically. And it's shocking, because it's like you're being shunned for being poor. You're being criminalized for being poor. And so I was just like, this is crazy. Like, you have to, you're just like, you're judged, and you are <coughs> made to bear a scarlet letter that is not your own making. It's just a societal view. And so you just, you just really find yourself on the outs of, of everything, because nobody wants anything to do with you. Um, and so, it's very isolating. Um, you have to figure out like where you're gonna get water, if you're gonna eat, where to go to the bathroom, um, and sometimes you don't get to eat. So you know, okay, you didn't get to eat the one day. Maybe tomorrow you'll have the luck, and uh, you know, you'll get to eat tomorrow. And so you know, then you have to find water and find some sort of connectivity because. When you're that isolated, um, you really start to fall apart emotionally, and physically, and mentally. And so then this became like a mission. And I was like, okay, this is testing me on every level possible. Emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And I said, okay, those Navy SEAL guys, they have a mission. And they don't stop until it's done. So that was my mindset. I was like, okay, this is what's happening now. And... Uh, those guys don't stop when they're done. I'm not stopping until I get housed. And then uh, I just kept going. And I found that there's this one, there's this one part where um, I was like, okay, I'm not making any fashion statements here, but I had to wear a black garbage bag because it was, the, the rains out here are crazy. They're just torrential. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going down Pacific. And uh, it's just raining torrentially, and there's like a break with the sea. And somebody's like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, yo, living the dream, dude. <laughs> 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 how you doing? And they're like, what? And they're like, this is what it's about. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is it, right here. And then I, I remember going to the homeless garden project, and people were like, you should check it out. So I did. 
And there's this lady there, and she's like, with her friend, and she's like, I didn't know the homeless were so talented. And I'm like, lady, it's not like we're raised by wolves. I'm a human being, I was housed, I'm house broken, what? You know? <laughs> And so I was just like finding finding ways to survive, and um, um, there's this one point in time where I didn't take my shoes off for two weeks because I was like, okay, nobody takes their shoes off unless they're they're, ha they're homeless, and then you're signaling people that you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there's no way that I was going to look like prey on any level. So I slept with my shoes on for two weeks. Um, also, um, I used to wrap a knife around my hand, you know. And uh, go to sleep on my on my walker, and just kind of go, hey, you know, whatever's out there, just let me see the light of day, just one more day, please, please, please. So uh, I I found myself uh, saved my art. I haven't showered in over a month. <clears throat> I had showered in over a month. And so I had to stop. I was like two blocks from Trader Joe's. And um, I said, I have to, I have to change my mindset. I can't do this. I have to change my mindset or I'm going to die. Because it was sucking me under, you know, all of it. And so uh, I was like, OK, what are the pros? I said, uh. I have unlimited time, I have no one to meet, I have nowhere to go, I have this incredible gap of experience before me. And I have a bus pass. <laughs> so I was dangerous. <laughs> um, and then I was like, okay, what, what, what can I do? And then it hit me, like I was blue. I was like, oh my god, like I have all this time, like what is this? What is this? And I was like, this is an adventure. Oh my God, I'm on, a, I'm on an adventure. And it was like, this is like Tom Sawyer. This is like Huckleberry Finn. This is like on the road. And I was like, I was on, oh my God. It was like, I had a revelation. I was like, I'm on an adventure. I'm on an adventure. And people were like, what? I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm on an adventure. This is great. And so I was like, what am I going to do? I said, I'm going to take photos. I'm going to be a photographer. And that made my artistic vision open up because I hadn't really been able to see anything except survival, and that had closed down my focus to like the head of a pin, because when you're just on this survival mode, like where am I going to sleep, where am I going to eat, can I go to the bathroom? I had to at one point, um, I stopped eating and drinking anything after five, because I was like, I'm not going to go to the bathroom outside, and, you know, two in the morning, three in the morning, and, uh, you know, risk myself for being sexually assaulted, or God knows what you can catch being outside because it's not pretty. And so my uh, my body started to shut down and uh, I remember I couldn't work uh, a nail clipper. I could not work a nail clipper. And I was like, this is really not cool. Not cool. And I was like, I have to get my nails trimmed. And so um, I'm struggling with a nail clipper and I, and I bought a bag of chip chips. I couldn't even open that. So I was like, I'm really weak. This is not cool. Like, I'm so defenseless right now. If somebody attacked me, I have no defenses. And so I got my friend and she's like, dude, you gotta eat chicken. And I'm like, what? And she's like, you need protein. And I'm like, but I'm a vegetarian. She's like, you have to eat chicken, dude. And I'm like, okay, fine, eat chicken. I hated that, but I had to get a burrito. <laughs> so <coughs> I got a burrito and uh, like a day later I was able to open stuff and I was like, oh, okay. So that's that was bad. And so after that, I just like, I just started taking pictures no matter what because I am an artist. And this is such a beautiful place that if you take a bad picture of Santa Cruz, it's on you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, um, I started taking pictures and um, I, I got into this church thing and somebody goes, they got food there. I'm, I'm so there. So I got, I got there and uh, I met my editor. Um, and his wife, uh, Ed Garner, and his lovely wife, Lynn. And uh, he said, hey, I heard you're a photographer. And I was like, well, how do you know that? And I was like, oh yeah, I told him. <laughs> 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 and so um, 
they, they, and you know, you saw my book, I mean, you saw, you saw my photos because I just had my cell phone with me. Thank you, Samsung. I have my cell phone with me, and so he's like, okay, we're going to make a book with your photos. And I'm like, what? And I was shocked because that's one of those things that I really wanted, you know, to have a book of my work, to be a photographer. And so, um, here it is. So, from shots on the fly. <laughs> we, um, we got this in the, in the, Bookshop Santa Cruz, and uh, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me, aside from this gallery showing. And so, um, you know, uh, art saved my life, it kept me going, gave me a purpose, aside from the Navy Seals and some rock and roll, and um, a lot of determination, because it's like, you know, you, you, you're, you're so isolated when, when you're homeless. You're shunned to society. Nobody wants anything to do with you. And all I could think was like, but I was a receptionist. Like, like I'm good people, you know? And so I understand the mindset that, you know, other people have about homelessness because I was raised with the same mindset as well, you know? Oh, those people. Those people. And it's like you're otherized. And then you get to the other side of things and you see, hey, those people are like those people. It's like we're all people. What is the big deal? Like, why can't somebody just be kind to somebody that's homeless? Because it's not even that you're homeless, because you're not embodying the state of homelessness. You can't do that. <coughs> it's just a condition, you know? You're not embodying the state. It's a condition. It's not It's not a, a state of being. So, you know, that, that whole thing of, of being homeless is just like um, a misnomer, a huge misnomer. And it's very divisive, and it's very isolating, and it's very... Um, it's, it's very challenging, to say the least. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, I, I won't take back my moments of homelessness. I will proudly say I was homeless. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, I'm happy to be here. It brought me to this moment, brought me to this gallery. I have a showing. It made me the photographer that I am today. It made me the human being that I am today. It made me the person that I am today. Um, it expanded my consciousness so much I can't even begin to tell you because it's impossible to put into words. I met so many awesome people and ironically I would have met those people had I not been homeless. So it's been a gift, it's been a blessing. Um, I could skyrocket if I could because I'm really proud of the fact that I did and, uh, and I'm here. And uh, I hope I've managed to help you guys get a different perspective on it. And thank you. Everybody for coming and a special thanks for sharing your journey with ladies. I know it's not easy. Um, my name is Erin Gady. Uh, I've been working on the issue of homelessness for a few years now um, in different cities across the country, which has given me an interesting perspective. It started in New York. Um, my graduate work, I focused on uh, formerly incarcerated folks looking for housing and the barriers that they face, and that led to my work in Miami. Um, and now, for the last year, I've been at the Homeless Services Center. I run the Recuperative Care Center for folks that are experiencing homelessness, the double trauma of homelessness and being recently uh, released from a hospital with serious conditions, illnesses, surgeries, whatnot. And then also Page Smith Community House is a HUD-funded transitional housing program. We have seven houses on campus. Um, I guess the piece that I'll add from what I've learned is homelessness is an intersection of so many different issues. That's what debunks every stigma. There's no one reason anybody becomes homeless. Um, and maybe I'll leave it at that. So I, I just want to just thank you so much for your courage in telling those stories. So I know it must be difficult sometimes to do that, and, and we're, we're, we've, we've all gained so much just from hearing from you on that, that, that story. I wonder if the next thing you might just tell us a little bit about the programs this, that you're working in and how they specifically made a difference, kind of what, what, what about them was worthwhile for you. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm currently living at the RCC, the Recuperative Care Center, and they have been such a blessing for me since I was released from the hospital. I cannot imagine um, going through double hernia surgery and then living in my suburban. Um, it wouldn't be possible. Um, so thank God that the Recuperative Care Center is, is there. I'd love to sound a baby. I thought I was going to have one. <laughs> Grandma in October, I was so excited. And that's another another impetus to get housed so that she can come to Grandma's house. Um, I'm here representing the Homeless Garden Project because it's done so much for me. Um, I think the biggest thing that the Homeless Garden Project has done for me is that it's given me back um, my, my belonging. Um, and my sense of pride in being who I am and um, just giving me my sense of value. The, the Homeless Garden Project values each one of us as a person. And, um, and that you, when you're homeless, it, that's a, it's lost because just, I think that the public perception of people that are unhoused is, is really um, bad. And there's casual comments in the grocery store, on the street, it's just over comments that, you know, that homeless guy or that, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you overhear stuff and it just, it brings you down that much more. And then, um, and then there's the virulent comments and the, the violence against um, homeless that, that um, brings you down even that much more. And so that Homeless Garden Project uplifts me. Um, and they, they have social services, we have social workers that work on helping us find housing, helping us through any uh, conflicts that we might have, helping us um, find solutions to any problems we might have, like with, like with me, it's parking tickets. <laughs> um, I have a big red Suburban, and sometimes I get parking tickets. And so helping me find a solution for that, you know, I'm on a payment plan with the city now. <laughs> 25 bucks a month until I'm dead, probably. Uh, but, uh, but it works for me. Um, and, um, and, you know, they, like, um, when I was injured, I you couldn't go back to the farm and do the farm work. So they found a place in the workshop where now I'm making the most beautiful, and I have to plug this, the most beautiful hand-dipped beeswax tapers, candles, oh my god. And it took me, there was nobody there to teach me because the woman who was making them prior to me left abruptly, and so there was this big vat of beeswax, and there was wicks, and there was weights, and all this stuff, and then there was just me. And they <laughs> said, Karen, you can make candles while you're healing. And I'm like, okay. And um, and they offered me the opportunity, and so I went on YouTube. <laughs> and I figured it out. It took me six weeks of trial and error, and you should have seen the wonky things I made at first. <laughs> and But the beauty of wax is that you can remelt it. You melt it down, and all I did was throw away the wicks. And I almost quit so many times, asked Katie, oh my god, I almost quit so many times because I'm like, I'm never going to get this right, it's lumpy, it's got lines in it. And, but eventually, um, I don't know, like three weeks ago or so, I came up with eight of the most beautiful, perfect, hand-dipped beeswax colors <coughs> that you can put in your candle holders at your dinner table and you'd be so proud to just like them. And they're just gorgeous. And, we sell them at our store on Pacific, so you'll have to just check them out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I do while I'm healing, is I make these beeswax tapers. And now that I make them so perfectly, she wants me to make 96 of them a week. But, you know, it's challenging and, and it's uplifting. And, it gave me a sense of community again because there's um, 20 of us that work at the Homeless Garden Project and there's there's employees that work there too. So it's just a big community of people 
that um, and we have we sit down and and on Tuesday mornings we talk about what's going on with us and you know, we share our our super dark secrets and we have um, on Fridays we have real talk and we share affirmation you know what have we accomplished this week and then a challenge you know what do we need to accomplish and then another affirmation and sometimes the affirmation can be um, you know I tied my shoes this morning or sometimes the affirmation can be you know I had this really big challenge and I overcame it and my affirmation is I finally learned how to make straight perfect papers <laughs> without screaming um, without pulling my curly red hair out. Um, and we do that together, so we really get to know one another, and we support each other, and we have community. And and I think that's what I miss the most about um, being unhoused, is, is being a part of the community. So I do um, volunteer work in other parts of the community, just so I can be a part of the community. The other thing that the Homeless Garden Project does for me and for us, my daughter works there too, is that um, volunteers come from, you know, either individually or from different companies. They come and work at the farm on Thursdays and Fridays, and they get to meet us, and they get to work alongside us, and get to know us, and they walk away with all their myths dispelled about the homeless. And they come back, and, you know, so it, it spreads you know, dispels the myths within the community, and I think that's a really important thing to do. Thank you. Sorry, what was the question? Just say, say a little bit about the HSC and 180-2020 programs, and how they made a difference for you. Oh, okay. um, so, um, <coughs> while I was homeless, um, I was told to sign up for a program of getting an apartment. Okay, I mean, I didn't really put too much faith in it because anything I'd ever heard was like, there's a 10 year wait list. And I'm like, what? But I did it anyway, and I'm really happy I did it because I'm here at my house, and it's, it's made such a difference. Um, and um, I have a caseworker that checks in with me at least twice a month, and so she gets to kind of, you know, get gauge about how I'm doing and stuff. And, like being unhoused and then being housed is such an adjustment because you just, um, it's almost like you don't know what to do with yourself, you know? Like how do you, how do you get normal again? How do you, how do you function as indoors for a permanent amount of time? And so it took me about six months, not since, I mean, I, I wake up for, for about six months in the middle of the night and just kind of check to see, you know, something could jump me, or take my stuff, but, but, you know. So that was kind of uh, an adjustment, and then and then trying to kind of uh, move forward with your life, but not really knowing how to be social again, because you kind of went to war in a way, and then people have other experiences. I mean, you know, we're, we're all kind of raised in a bubble, and then we've been beyond the bubble. And you got to talk to people that are still in their bubble. It's kind of like, wow, this is not. Mm -mm. <laughs> this isn't. Yeah, I, I can't talk to about jeans for like a, and a half hour, no. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's kind of a different thing because it just gives you a different perspective on, on life. And so um, it, that's been an adjustment for me, like being uh, social again. That's, that's been huge. It's, I'm still working on it. Um, so um, then, you know, my caseworker was like, you, you need to get your work seen. And I'm like, uh, you mean, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> it didn't take much convincing. And so she, uh, she helped set this up, and then here I am now. And I'm really happy. Uh, you can see my photos uh, back there. This is all done. And um, yeah, I'm just really grateful because now it's like this. So this, has led, this has led me to a bigger audience as far as like, getting people to know that, you know, just because you're homeless doesn't mean you're a criminal. You dispel all the myths associated with it because actually what happens and most people don't realize this is that if you're living in third world conditions 
while you're homeless. And nobody gets that. You know, you're you're rifling through garbage cans to get food, which is which is shocking and unheard of. Like you should not have a fellow human being do that, you know? Especially a fellow, like, you know, you're a fellow citizen. Why are you rifling through garbage in order to eat? Why are you sleeping outside? Why isn't somebody saying, hey, you know what? Offer you like, you know, like there should be a center where you can go and, and get like some something that will make you feel human because it's really challenging to not have a shower, not have access to the things that we all take for granted when, when we have housing, you know? Um, and then the biggest challenge for me was to hold on to my humanity. That was huge because it's like it, it really dehumanizes you and people are so cool. And um, just based on their judgments, just based upon their thoughts, just based on the fact that you know, they're pulling back because you haven't had a shower in a month, I'm sorry, but you have no place to go for a shower. And all you want to do is just like try to be as human as possible. And people, it's almost like people don't let you get out of that system. It's like the system isn't designed to help you. you know? Society just looks at you as, as like, um, your social value becomes non-existent on your own. You have no social value whatsoever. And so that's how you're looked down upon and that's how you're treated. And then um, it can affect you greatly. Um, so I, to counter that, I just, I was like, okay, so I don't have boatloads of money yet, but I have boatloads of F you attitude. <laughs> I'm an artist. Nobody can take that away from me. So as attitudinal as people may have been towards me, I was very attitudinal back. I just I just didn't didn't uh, didn't take that as any any sort of indication of what it was because I know who I am. And so I was like, okay, I got boatloads of F you right here, right now. That's what you want. So <laughs> that's also kept me going. Um, plus having a sense of humor is really key. You, you gotta have those moments because otherwise it's just like, it, you know, it really can, it can suck you under. Um, so yeah, I, I just, there's so many people that, I, that I've met and you get help along the way. And I didn't just become a photographer on my own. I had my editor help me. I had a lot of people encourage me. I had a lot of people buy my work because I was also selling postcards and I got the best compliment ever when people were like, dude, I couldn't, I couldn't send them off. I kept them all myself. <laughs> I was like, gosh, thanks. That's really, that's really nice of you guys, you know? So, um, I know one of my postcards ended up in Singapore. So I'm really happy. <laughs> and um, it's just, like, uh, it's something that people need to know that, you know, you, there's something that can be done. You just have to be willing to accept other people in your neighborhood, you know? Um, you have to look at the fact that it's just a human being going through an experience. It's not like that's their identity. Almost this is not an identity, it's just an experience. So once we remove the stigma of that, then we can all move forward, you know? We can find more little, uh, more solutions more readily because while you have that gap of like the stigma, you know, you have a lot of, of like little patches of like hope in there and light, but you have to break that wall so that people are like, well, hey, I can help this person out. They just have a rough patch. I mean, life is hard, you know? Not, it's not all roses and you know, champagne. You really have to, you know, you, you hit upon some rough patches and uh, you, you have to stop this isolationist mentality of like, you have to pull yourself up from your own bootstrap. It's like, dude, sometimes you just need a little bit of help, that's all. You don't really want a handout. You just, you just want some help to get out of your, your situation. So once people you know, realize that, I think they're more willing to help you because um, people look upon homelessness as a burden. It's a burden upon society. Well, if a country like Germany can eradicate homelessness, what does that say about us? You know, we just have to unify and be like, yeah, we can do this. We can tackle this problem and make it disappear. So I hope you know you guys have a better understanding of what it's like to be homeless. And you know, next time you see a homeless person. If, even if you don't say anything, just just have a kind thought. That's all. You know, just have a kind thought. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit different twist for you. Um, maybe you could just say what in your work, in your experience, what are some of the 
couple of the most pressing needs that people you're working with are articulating to you that you're trying to address? Okay. Um, so what I think was really well summarized just now is that homelessness can happen to anybody. And I think this year, um, it was very evident to me in the government shutdown in January. All of these federal workers were laid off for one month and were suddenly relying on food donations and loans from credit unions, demonstrating that so many of us are one paycheck away from homelessness. What I've seen specifically um, working in the recuperative care is health care is a big part of that. One medical emergency um, can really put you in a bad spot. So I think our program is pretty unique in that those of you who haven't been to the Homeless Service Center, we're like a campus. Um, we have a bunch of different programs. And the Recuperative Care Center uh, partners with HPHP, the Homeless Persons Health Project. It's a clinic of county nurses that have been there for 30 years, dedicated to serving the homeless population. Um, so people that are in really bad shape, battling cancer, um, major surgeries, horrible accidents, can come to the Recuperative Care Center and get the wraparound support that they need, not just, you know, um, bandages for their wound, but caseworkers to help them figure out what they're going to do after they recuperate. Time to rest. I mean, if you're on the streets, it's pretty impossible to um, physically heal from a serious surgery. Um, it's also an amazing support to our community because oftentimes the people that are released before they're ready um, will be readmitted to hospitals, that's ambulance costs to the community. So I think um, the health care that we provide through the recuperative care center is, is pretty huge. Thanks. So uh, the last kind of structured question, um, and I, I want to acknowledge you've already answered this uh, in a few different times in different ways, but maybe if you could just pick out, because sometimes it's so important to think about when people leave, like what are they going to take away? There's your whole story, but sometimes it needs to be distilled a little bit. And if you were just trying to say to folks who didn't know that much about the experience of homelessness, what is it, the one thing you want them to know, or maybe two things, that, you know, just that they might not realize about um, homelessness that, you know, might really make, be transformative if the whole community understood it. Um, we had a, a discussion with, um, with someone from a, a focus group at the Homes Garden Project a week ago. Um, and one of the biggest problems there's not enough affordable housing in Santa Cruz, um, and 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 I don't want to like put the onus on the university, but the university um, doesn't have enough. They have an increase in students, but they don't have an increase in housing, and so the the university students are taking up a lot of the um, affordable housing that that could go to um, you know people like me or or, you know, similar people who are renting rooms. You know, university students take up a lot of that. One of the, uh, my supervisor in the workshop moved here 10 years ago from um, Florida, and she has a home on a street, and she said 10 years ago, everybody on her street had their own house, and, um, and now she's, uh, she, there's only two people, two families that, that live in their own home and the rest are rented out to university students because it's just much more profitable. Um, and so it's just gotten really congested on our street. It makes her crazy, but it's just much more profitable to you know rent out to university students. So that is that's one factor. Um, and the other thing is is that, you know, and I think that Andrea made a really good point is that the divisiveness. I have a lot of hope, you know, because I meet people in, in all different facets of the community. I have a lot of hope that, that people can turn this, this
divisiveness around. I think that if we just look at it as housed and unhoused, um, and it's it's not a because you know, as soon as you say homeless, you know, it brings a picture in your head that's not pretty. It brings a picture in my head that's not pretty. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of hope in it. If we meet together in, in situations like this and we start talking, we find solutions because there are solutions out there. There's um, federal government loans at, at 1% if you, um, you know, if you decide to build for farm workers, for example, if you build a unit in your garage and, and house a farm worker, you can get a federal loan of 1%. Um, and we're farm workers, by the way, so if anybody wants to <laughs> 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 um, you know, stuff like that. So th there's all kinds of creative solutions that, that you can look into. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think uh, the, you know, the biggest thing to realize is that, you know, this is solvable. This is very, we can solve this problem. Um, we just have to change our mind shift and create a, a new perspective on how to approach this because, you know, we're just helping another human being out. It's not, it, it, I mean, it's, it's somebody's mother or brother or cousin. It's like a family member. This person didn't just, you know, spring up from nowhere. This is a human being with, you know, that, that has a story. Like, everybody has a story. And it's not always, you know, the stereotype that you just kind of think automatically when you, when you think of somebody who's homeless because uh, there's a lot of drug use among these people, but that's, and you see that, of course, but the only reason you see that is because they're not housed. That's the main thing, and that's why they have, you know, if, if they had a place to do it privately, you wouldn't see that. You would think of homeless people with drug problems because you're not seeing it, you know? And it's just prevalent everywhere. But, you know, people also, um, just in trying to deal with, with getting out of homelessness, don't start using drugs to numb themselves or anything else because it's very difficult to be marginalized, it's very difficult to be shunned. Um, it, uh, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's really heartbreaking, you know. When you're just trying to get through your day, these folks, everybody's just trying to survive. They just want to get on with their lives and we just need a way to get that to everyone, that it's not like you know, people just want to be. Um, it's not like a career choice. You don't go to school. <laughs> you know, oh, I would be homeless. Yeah, that's my thing. It's um, it's it's definitely not your fate of heart. And anyone who has survived for very long periods of time um, is to be commended on some level because it's really damned hard. It's really damned hard. And um, you gotta have a lot of courage and a lot of heart to just um, go through life with just the clothes on your back and maybe all of your belongings in a backpack and that's all you have. And so, you know, it's not something that I would suggest everybody take on. <laughs> but it's it's something that, you know, think about it. You know, somebody's just trying to get through their day. They just, they just want to know that they can also get back to, to being who they were because it's uh, it's very challenging. So yeah, if you guys can can uh, eradicate the stigma, new solutions will appear. New solutions will totally appear, and um, we can actually shift the social level of how we are um, grouped now. And uh, it's just like it's one human being helping another. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Um, I think a big part of the stigma is also that a lot of people seem to think that the people that they see on the streets aren't part of our community. Um, and I can say from the programs that I run, and I have over 60 people in my programs, the majority of them are from Santa Cruz. There's lawyers, medical professionals, college graduates. Um, we really need to work on breaking down that stigma because it's impairing us from seeing this as a community issue that impacts all of us. And I just wanted to drive home Karen's point too that we have a housing crisis. There's a lack of affordable housing in Santa Cruz. 
I can give the folks in my programs all the services I have access to. But if I can't house them, if there's not housing available, we won't break the cycle of homelessness. questions. We know sometimes people feel the need to make a comment rather than ask a question and we're just going to roll with that. That's okay, but you still just get one minute. So whether you want to say something for one minute or ask a question within one minute, that's fine. But um, here we go. And you guys good to go with that? Sure. Yeah. Okay, who's, yeah. anyone have a question? Let's start over here. Great, thanks so much. Um, in regards to the, the, the meals over the day services that were closed in 20, I believe it was 2016, um, because of a budget, significant budget for it, are there any plans to reopen that, those day services, and how would you go about doing that in terms of uh, acquiring the funding? And I know that's a large question, but it's an important question because uh, housing is great, but unless people can get from day to day with the basic essentials, uh, it's a mute point. Please. Okay, let me try my best to answer this. Um, 2016, you said? Did you say this happened in 2016? Yes, uh, there were meals being offered uh, twice a day over at the Homeless Services Center. So I can say we still offer those meals to our program participants. Um, it's not available to the community at large right now. We do do special, you know, on holidays and such, but, um, and Phil's right here. I'm wondering if he's channeling to me. Um, <laughs> but funding our services is a big problem. I think until we see this as the crisis that it is, we're not going to prioritize the funding that we need to be able to provide services like meals to the community or um, having enough staff or, I mean, it's an issue across the board, how we're going to fund it. Um, I'll ask you guys. Well, maybe if they take some of the money out of the, that they're spending on criminalizing the people on the street and policing them, that maybe some of that money could go towards funding meals, um, showers, and other things to the, all of the community here. So I think a good example of that is the model of the recuperative care center. So instead of the cost of the community of those readmissions to the hospitals, the ambulance, we develop a program that meets people where they're at, gives them the services that they need, and helps solve the solution rather than I'll just chime in, and you, I think you somewhat answered your, the question we can ask you, but it really, you know, the programs that exist in the community tend to follow where the resources are, where the money from funding sources are. And so if the different levels of government and the community that provide that funding start saying, well, we want you at a homeless services center to provide this kind of service rather than that kind of service, that's what they'll do, because if they stick with the old thing, there won't be any money to do that old thing. And I think that's, I feel like that's probably the kind of a simple version of what happened with some of the day-to-day, day -day, you know, meal programs. So, next question. So, I guess, maybe this is a comment, sorry, but like, what if the dehumanization brings, like, the lack of services or money for homelessness doesn't isn't caused by the dehumanization, but we've decided that in some way it's more important that billionaires make more and more money rather than that we invest in the people of our community. And that's why, you know, on a day-to-day -day level, people, there's no way to help people, so they just turn off and they dehumanize and that makes it easier, that makes this process easier. 
So we need to, I think if you're right, we do need to rehumanize people, but then say we need to invest in, in everybody. And to say that there's no funding, I mean, this town, there are so many, there are billionaires here that there are, you know, billions of dollars in real estate here, in vacant um, units. So we can't just say, oh, this is a federal problem. You know, we need to get money from the federal government. Maybe there are revenue sources here. We can, uh, we can stop spending so much money on giving you parking tickets, you know, <laughs> trying to collect those. Like, how much money did it cost in administrative costs? Did it take to bleed you for all those parking tickets, you know? So, and I have a specific question. I had, um, when I was at Ross Camp, somebody said they were undocumented, so they couldn't take a shower at the Homeless Services Center. So I just want to follow that. Not accurate. Do they have to show an ID? Um, they get a visitor pass when they come to the front. There's not an ID for day services at the bathroom and the showers and stuff. Okay. So what is it what is it that's preventing the community as a whole from at least providing showers and bathroom facilities to people who are maybe having to sleep in their cars? Is it just money or what what's the root problem? So maybe there's a little bit of a myth there. We do provide day services which include bathroom access and free showers. How many people can you handle a day? How many people can the center handle a day? Well, 100. Okay, and how many people are on, are on the streets in Santa Cruz, in the city of Santa Cruz? They're homeless. Only 500? Well, in the okay. county, it's about 2,500, and the city is probably around 1,000. Well, that's yeah. two years ago, the census, right? Yeah, that's, the, that's all we know. I mean, well, I, it could be different. Come. It could be different than that. That's the best numbers we have. Should come out any day. Yeah, so maybe. <laughs> Comment is just like, I know we're waiting for the local report, and other communities have been the same kind of survey. <coughs> They've shown local increases in terms of like 50%, 60%, and there's no reason to expect centers would be less than that. So, well, with my page spent the transitional housing program, there's a world of paperwork, as you can imagine. And um, on one of the pieces of paper, it asks participants to identify that they're low income by HUD standards. And who wants to guess what that is annually? Yeah. I checked that box too. 30,000? 55. 55. So just to give some context to how expensive it is to live in this community. If you're already battling all of these uphill battles that we've been talking about, it's a housing crisis. Perhaps one other response that I think we've about why, even though there certainly are day services, some day services available at the homeless service center, the need is bigger than that one facility can manage. And one of the things we've seen just lately, and it's not new, but it got bigger, is that it's very difficult to find the physical location to do services for people experiencing homelessness without those who do business or live nearby reacting very negatively to that. And that is real. I mean, whether we like that or not, we can't pretend that that isn't a major obstacle. And I think that is one of the reasons why we have to have the conversations we've been having here is to remind people um, in the community that this is not some invading alien force, you know, that's coming to, you know, to be homeless in my neighborhood. This, these are our neighbors. These are people in our community who need a place to live in different ways. And I mean, who sleep, but also live their lives. And and we, you know, it's a challenge that one of the many challenges I think we have to overcome in in this work. Um, just, just one thing a lot of friends, neighbors, whatever say, 
is that there's a certain part of homelessness that is drug related. And there is a certain part of homelessness that are people that don't want to get off the streets. And so I don't always know what to say to them in response to that because I, I don't particularly subscribe to that belief and I volunteered at the Homeless Services Center and so I, I and it was the Homeless Garden Project. So they're like, well, why are we going to help these people that are on drugs? Why don't we just throw them in jail? Why don't we separate them out? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I, I can't speak for, I, I can speak for um, what I have heard and, if, you know, from, from them. Um, and, the Homeless Services Center, where I'm staying right now, is was right across from the Ross Camp. I know um, that the offer was, um, you know, in court to build like a, a FEMA camp, where they would have to um, they would have to be clean and sober. They would have to they would, they would build them tents. Um, they would have to um, it, they would basically have to check in. And they would have a curfew, and and there was yeah. quite a few people that just were not willing to do that, and um, and I think the solution is to change their mindset because you know they just have to they're going to have to come along and play with the program because there is a certain responsibility to living in society that they are just not down with, and it's you know if you if you force them into a program, um, they may succeed, they may fail, but eventually they will succeed. And just give them no other options. Because there is no, I feel, like there is no, you don't have that kind of freedom. You can't just live on the street and do whatever the hell you want. You can't just break the laws like that and do whatever the hell you want. You know, there, there are responsibilities to living in this community and there's responsibilities to living in this country and, and you're going to have to step up and, and take care of those responsibilities. I don't think that, that homelessness and um, or living on the streets means that you have absolute carte blanche to do whatever you feel like doing, whatever you feel like doing it. That's not okay. And especially when um, a lot of times it's those types of people that are the criminal element that, that break into cars and and break into houses and, you know, you, you know, I mean, drug addiction, I mean, I know from personal experience, drug and alcohol addiction can be a very overwhelming thing, but there's treatment for it. You know, and there's a lot of good treatment centers in this county, there's, and there's <coughs> meetings all over the place. And, um, you know, shining example, you know, my beautiful daughter, um, I don't want to help you too much. <laughs> um, she was an IV drug user and an alcoholic, and she did it herself. You know, she went to treatment, but then she relapsed, and then she just pulled herself up by her bootstraps and went to meetings on her own, and she's been clean and sober for since February 10th. Since February 10th. Decision is possible, you know, and I don't think I don't think that we should give them that choice. I don't think they should be able to make that choice to just you know live on the streets and use drugs. That should not be an option. Yeah. And this will be our last comment. Um, yeah. The one thing I'd like to say about the people that are on the other side of things and. Um, the biggest thing that would change everybody, or at least a good portion of people that are homeless, is that if they knew people cared, people would be more than happy to get into a drug treatment program or make whatever necessary changes they needed to. They just need to know that they matter. You know, if somebody knows that they matter, they're cared for, the change is uh, indescribable and amazing and, and, and done, basically. It, it'll, it'll, it'll get done. As long as people realize, hey, you know what? I may be on my own, but there are people out here willing to help me. People really care about me. They see me as a person. They see me as an individual. I don't, I'm not seen as somebody that's having no social value whatsoever. Yeah, 
we're going to make a huge shift in society if, if that happens. Because all people want to know is that you know somebody out there cares for them. They matter. And yeah, changes will occur. Um, just from my experience, I, I hear this point a lot about um, the substance abuse and uh, everybody I've worked with in the last couple of years all over this country, the people that are using substance are trying to numb other traumas and that's exactly why they need services um, to get to the root of those traumas and connect them with the resources that they need. Okay, thank you so much for joining us and for your questions and, and I know these folks will stick around for a little bit if you want to chat them individually and I again want to thank our panel so much for sharing your experience.